Welcome to the Photographer Academy. I'm going to be joined shortly by Tom Knowles, where we're talking about architectural photography. Uh, remember, it's a live session, so please get the questions in as we go along. If you're watching as a, mem a member or on YouTube uh, following this se session, please don't ask any questions below <laughs> because there's no follow up. Uh, but it's a good way if you actually see it. But um, anyway, uh, Tom, are you with me? I'm on board. We've done a test, so some of you saw us in a Hello, good evening, Tom. I'm here. Hi, good, good, good. Welcome. See, now, three years ago, it was lockdown week three, the start of. Uh, and isn't that weird? Three years. It feels like deja vu coming back on screen, to be honest. It, 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 well, I, I've always been on screen, so I, I basically, in lockdown, didn't know anything different. It was just the same, you know, normal, as it were. Uh, but, yeah, I, I just, uh, somebody was speaking to me today and just said, I can't believe it's over three years now. I went, no, it's not, is it? <laughs> anyway, welcome, Tom. Uh, it's the first time we've chatted, isn't it? I know we were online together a couple of minutes ago and things, really. Uh, thanks from on, on behalf of everybody who's registered. Uh, there's some amazing photographs we're going to look at tonight. Um, and so I think we just chat away to begin with. Tell us a little bit about you to begin with, if that's okay, Tom. Bring sure, us up to speed on who and what you are and where you are in the world, etc. So I'm, I'm a school teacher. I've been teaching for about 11 or, or 12 years. And um, really, I suppose I've only got into photography quite recently. I started off, I mean, I guess like most people in school, I used a dark room and developed photos. But it wasn't something I initially sort of latched onto and, and, and loved. I mean, I enjoyed it, but it wasn't something that I thought this, this is my passion at the time. And I guess it was only when I traveled um, to Columbia, I used to live in, in South America, that fortunately the guy, the chap that I worked with, he was a photographer for a, a broadsheet. So he used to take me on all sorts of, of trips. And that's how I kind of fell in love with the, the photography side. And, and when I returned from South America, I bought myself a DSLR. And it actually sounds quite old now saying DSLR is not that many new cameras are DSLRs anymore. It, 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 yeah, uh, for me, it was, you know, I, I had somebody comment on YouTube the other day about a film that I made and they were saying that you still use the ter the terminology of school. I lost you there, Tom. Have you gone? Oh, he's back. Um, Sorry, I, I don't know what happened there. I'm using the ter the terminology of film. And and they were saying, is it politically correct to talk about film? It was like, I think so. You know, it's where I come from. It's where I spent all my youth in the dark room and everything else with it. Things really. Um, how how did you get going with arch architectural photography then? Because there's so many different genres of photography and things. Where did you get going? I I guess it was I I love I've always loved going out into London as a child. I remember my parents took me out and just going through the streets to museums and galleries. I was always sort of quite in awe with the buildings, and I I sort of like formality and form and shape, and it, it kind of just naturally lent sort of my passions and, and what I enjoyed seeing. In the past as a child and my experiences to the type of photography that, that i take pictures of really so so as a full-time teacher how do you um balance your photography time now and things really is that difficult for you or um it, it wasn't until lockdown and it wasn't until the onset of covid because i, I luckily i i'm fortunate enough to have quite long holidays so in term time i i don't really do a great deal apart from the odd weekend trip and then i plan projects for longer holidays that, that I'm off school, particularly the summer. And is it a, a business for you as well, or is it more of a hobby kind of thing? Is it a mainstream architectural photography? Is that what you kind of aim at? Yeah, it's not it's not really a business at all. I mean, I have I have sold photos. Um, they have been bought before, but it's not something that I, I purposefully seek out. Yeah, good. Okay, should we get into the first shot of the day? Is that okay? Yeah, let's do it. Fantastic. So, one of the amazing images that we use to uh, promote the uh, tonight's session, as such. Tell us about where we are. So, this was a, a trip to Baku in Azerbaijan. Um, it sits on the Caspian Sea. It borders Iran to the south, and you've got Russia to the north. So, it, it's sort of that Eurasia kind of area. And I've always been really inspired by Zaha Hadid. 
And this was one of the buildings that I just I'd seen in pictures before on social media, maybe on Flickr or on photography websites. And I knew I just had to get out there to photograph it. And uh, I took a trip one summer, uh, three or four years ago, I guess. And uh, yeah, this was one of the photos that I took that I was really pleased with. Are there any restrictions um, with security or policing, you know, when you're photographing buildings and things? You know, it's not as if you're just turning up with a little kind of sling over the shoulder, snap, got an image. You know, there's there, there, there's a little bit more work going on, isn't there? Uh, and, and are you worried about security when you kind of set out to do these kind of shots or what? How does it unfold? I mean, it's quite tricky in places like London. It is a worry when I go, to, especially in, in the UK, all the pseudo sort of public space is really tricky to photograph on. Um, but I mean, Azerbaijan seems to be a really open country. They really welcome visitors and tourists and, and people are, are more interested in, in what, pe what someone would be doing with a tripod and a, a, a lens rather than questioning them. So it was a really nice open space. I could really relax and, and get into my photo photography there. So, yeah, it wasn't a problem at all. A really friendly, hospitable country. So when you arrive at a location like, like this, obviously, thanks to Google Maps, Google and everything, you pretty much know what you're going to face as soon as you arrive. Are you planning a certain time and date based around the research online prior or are you doing a visit and staying there for the day? How does it work? I sort of always plan quite meticulously in terms of the, the style and types of photos that I'm going to shoot, but the, the lighting and the weather is is more potluck more often than not. But I, I went to Azerbaijan, Baku, for a good four or five days. So I, I thought I'm bound to get some good weather in those four or five days. And, and sure enough, I, I did. It was, it, I mean, sometimes it's really lucky. Sometimes I come away with absolutely nothing and, and they're more interior shots if there's no light or it's a dull day. But, but yeah, I, I hit the jackpot with this one, I guess. Mm. And specifically, do you want internal light? Are you going at the end of the day for that reason or the beginning of the day? How does your mind work? Yeah, I, I normally scout it out um, sometime in the day. It's, it's not great for shooting when the, when the sun is high in the sky. So I then come back just before golden hour and typically I'll set up my tripod and I'll, I'll take photos all the way through from just before golden hour all the way until the sun sets. So I, sometimes I'm there at a tripod for an hour and a half, two hours, so that I can select the the lighting that that sits across or or falls on the building in the way that I want it when I'm processing the photos. Because they're not they're not all straight shots, and this is probably a, a composite of a, a sky and a couple of other photos. And what do you do? Strip in then and things really? Do you, are you using just Photoshop? Are you using anything specific? Um, yeah, mainly just Photoshop layering. I'll, I'll remove anything that's a, a real distraction. If there's lots and lots of people in the photo and it, it doesn't work, I'll, I'll strip the people back. Um, I don't like to, to put extra people in, um, but I, I do take out quite a lot. Or if there's marks on the floor, I'll clear those up. And it's amazing what sort of removing a few blemishes, a few birds can do. Um, it can really clear up and make the, the photo, although it may be more simple, it's just much more eye-catching and, and gives that, that image more impact, I think. Mm. A couple of questions coming through already and things. Do you submit into uh, the likes of photo li libraries or anything with your photography? No, ab absolutely no libraries at all, no. A re reason for that? that or? Or? It's something reason? I really thought about it, to be honest. Um, I mean, it's something I, I've, I've, I could ponder, but I, I've got no sort of ambitions of, of placing them in a library at all. Yeah, yeah, and it's not the way it used to be many years ago. Uh, what about colouring and things, really? How much post-production is in stylization of colour? Um, so is it a natural sky, even though it's stripped, it's stripped, stripped in? Is it its own natural sky? I'm... It is more or it's more or less as I would see it with the eye. Um, the the lights that are coming out of the building are, are definitely not those lights at the time. That would be later on in the evening, because in fact I don't even think the lights were on at, at that particular time. But the okay. the sky and the 
the foreground is more or less um, straight from camera. With a few tweaks, obviously, um, just to balance bits and pieces, but yeah, more or less. Good. Another question. Have you, uh, so do you ever get Ted did to remove all, all of the people in such a beautiful location? Often. I, I, re I do really like stripping it right back. I only I only leave people in if, if they add to the photo, if maybe there's a quirk about them, if they're doing something quite interesting. Um, sometimes it, it just lends itself really well to capture that place and that moment. Sometimes it's quite a cultural thing as well. I, me I remember in Valencia, there's lots of cyclists that cycle around the, the sciences park and, and I deliberately left those in, but other other buildings, I strip them right back. Yeah, cracking. Lovely. Let's go to the next image, shall we? Next shot. Inside. Inside. So I promise not to show you any more of Baku, but I, I thought this was a, a fantastic one to 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 place in in this talk tonight. I mean, I, I couldn't have been more lucky, I guess, with the characters that I saw at that moment, and it it feels almost like I'd set this up, but absolutely not. I, I didn't know any of them at all. And actually, I was going around just taking photos of corners and, and, and white spaces around geometric patterns. And then suddenly I saw this group of all these four characters wearing very different stylized clothes, all, all unique, all grinning and smiling and moving in a certain way. And I just got the camera out, moved it around and took a few photos of them before they uh, clocked me and, and sort of changed their, their natural, the way they're naturally acting. So that's natural. Yeah, that's that's literally. I, I remember swinging the camera around, and I, I could not have imagined in all my dreams there's such an eclectic mix of people with different clothing. And you know, you, you've got one with his Hawaiian shirt and luminous shoes, the other with his quite neat um, pink um, button-down shirt. Some with the shorts, a long dress. You know, there, there was that interaction of all these different friends. I presume. And it, it was just brilliant the way they were moving their arms. And the, and the great thing was that inside this building, um, the architect obviously invites, or, or my take is it invites the, the people that are going into the building to sort of not only walk up the, the walls, but sort of the walls merge into the sides of the building. And there's that kind of interaction that the architect has with, with those that are visiting the building. And it's almost like a challenge uh, or people are being challenged to walk up the walls and experience the architecture in, in such a tactile way. And I, I thought I captured that just perfectly. I, I, I've got commercial friends of mine that would actually do a cast casting to get those characters to be in that place at <laughs> that time. <laughs> and it was completely luck. Absolutely yeah. completely luck. Well, well, okay. Brilliant though. But I actually have a really nice story about the, the whole experience in Baku. I can remember standing outside um, for the shot that you saw just before. And it's a very hospitable place. And they don't have a great deal of visitors, not from Europe anyway. And there were two uh, photographers, two, two women from um, Azerbaijan that came up to me and were asking me about where I was from and what I was doing. And obviously, I don't speak any Russian at all. But they spoke in English and it, it was really nice because we engaged in a conversation. They showed me some of their photos and it, and it ended up with um, these two sisters taking me out um, that evening. They showed me all around the city, some of the Middle Eastern architecture, some of the wow. old sort of Russian um, Soviet architecture, the flame towers. Um, and I had some some local food. So it was really nice to be toured around by by locals as well. Just really welcoming, great place to, to visit. Very interesting. Oh, brilliant. But, uh, yeah, great. Okay, um, no questions coming through on that one yet. Let's go to this one, which I absolutely love this image. Where is this done? So this is in Berlin. I, I, was, I was coming back from a friend's wedding and I was, I was rushing through Berlin and I stumbled upon the, I think it's the Cinematic Museum in Berlin. And I had about an hour to kill. I remember going in, I had my camera, with no intentions of taking any photos. I'm, I'm just interested in technology, especially with this kind of retro feel. And I came to this sort of window uh, where there's this amazing staircase. It was framed perfectly by the walls. And then a member of staff walked down 
And I, I just love what she's wearing. Well, I mean, I, I wouldn't wear it myself, obviously, but it has that kind of um, German retro futuristic vibe about it. And I kind of just caught her just on almost the rule of thirds. Um, and again, I think she just clocked me and you can see she's making eye contact with the camera at the time. Uh, and I, I've captured her and her mood and the clothing and it all fits together. Not that she was very happy about that. And I certainly had an earful in, in German about taking a photo of her. But by that time, I, I had the pictures in my camera. And you don't care? Um, well, I... I I know. I, I, don't, I, was I don't want people to, to be upset at all, but I wasn't going to delete the photos, no. No, brilliant. So, um, you know, you, you're not having any issues getting in anywhere to take photographs. So, uh, Well, in the past with these photos, I wasn't because I was actually using a micro four thirds camera. I had a tiny uh, Pen F, Olympus Pen F, and it looks like a tiny range finder and the lenses are really small. Um, so that was much easier to get these cameras in. They didn't look professional looking, so security wouldn't approach me like they do now. Now I've got my Sony, um, but obviously the the light, the response to low light with a, a micro four thirds camera isn't great. So I, I, I changed my system. And in some ways I, I have regrets because it was just so easy to get these kind of shots. Mm. So speaking about equipment, what are you using now? I've got an A7R2, um, one of the old sort of iterations. Um, it's a bit slow. There's buffer issues, but for setting up architectural shots or or anything landscape-wise, it, it is perfectly reasonable. It does the job really well, and I've got some some nice lenses for it. So that's the important thing, really. Mm. But I will, I will eventually upgrade to a quicker Sony. Question through about teaching <clears throat> uh, somebody else's teacher as well. Um, is your photography a part of your teaching? Well, uh, if it's not, do you run a photographic club in school or anything? How does it work for you? Um, I used to run a photographic club in school, and I mean, there, there's elements that that I have integrated into teaching. I teach technology, and for the the year fives, uh, cup, uh, last year we made some handheld filters. They use their iPads and they put the the filters up against them um, once they've been designed cut out and made and put together and then we use lightroom i taught them how to use the the software to edit those photos that they'd taken with the filters and then we printed those photos out so there, there was the whole sort of experience of building something that they could use with say an ipad or or their own device and then having that tangible photo in their hands that at the end that end product as well but I don't, I don't teach photography um, as, a, as a subject, though. OK, great. Next image, then, is it? I, I love this shot, by the way. I've got to say, it's just absolutely... I, I did a, a shoot for a <clears throat> um, Soundforge, they were called, um, talking. It was film years, a long time ago. And basically, we're in Soho, shooting from one building to another. And I basically set three televisions up with three different videos uh, of the same eye in each of them. Um, and then basically we're communicating on the telephone across the, from one build into another. So the guy sat in the window and kind of, as soon as I saw this image, it, it, gave, it gave me that kind of uh, mem memory back and things really. But that's, that's a cracking idea. I absolutely love it. Very jealous of it and things really. But uh, anyway, back to it. Next image. <clears throat> Oh yeah, this this was one that um, I like this for a number of reasons. Apart from it being a quite a successful image in competitions, um, this was taken in the the V and A Museum in London. Um, I mentioned before that it's it's quite tricky um, photographing anywhere in in London at all or any major city now. In interior photos, as soon as you take a camera out, you're asked to put it away. But one of the the few places that really encourages art photography and, and creative flair is the vna and i remember setting my camera up and it's actually on a glass cabinet with the reflection and some of the security came down they were really interested in what i was doing and they they made sure that i had the time and space to take the photos uh, rather than ask me to move on so hats off to to the vna for just really allowing me to get on with with taking a photo and that's the end result mm. 
a lot of black and white coming through. Do you, sorry, question. A lot of black and white coming through. <clears throat> is this something that you specialise in? Um, I, I do like monochrome, black and white images. I, I like to strip photos back a lot. And I think it's a lot about the shape and the lighting um, that I'm really interested in. So I think taking away that colour allows you to, to focus on, on the actual architecture at times. I mean, colour. sometimes you, you need colour, but some of my photos, are, I enjoy just that kind of, really, that focus. Um, any tips on exposure, exposure for an interior like this? Yeah, lots of, lots of ones like this. I've taken multiple shots. You, you, you can never tell the light coming through the, the windows. I set a camera up, I, I lock a focus on, make sure the aperture's the same all the way through. And then I, I change the shutter speed to balance when it, it's metering to balance that light. Um, and as long as it's on a stable sur surface, it doesn't matter if the, the speed is different from one shot to another. Very good. Um, sorry, I was interested. The um, I know there's a colour image coming up in a minute. Talked about exposure. I should have knocked that one off there. The uh, contrast within your black and whites. Is there a, cer a certain preset that you use, or is everyone different? I don't really use presets. I I spot change the, the contrast everywhere in the whole image until it, it balances. Sometimes it doesn't take long. Sometimes it's a process that can take hours. And I can sit at the, at the computer for you know three or four hours making sure it, it balances. OK. Uh, what's your preferred work in aperture? It depends on the sweet spot for the lens. But I remember my Micro Four Thirds, it was about f11. Um, the lens I've got that I use quite a lot for the Sony it, it's probably around f7 actually okay uh, and the question goes on to uh, what kind of lenses do you carry in your bag when you go out to do a shoot I've got a wide angle lens um, I've got an 85 that I use quite a lot for interior corners and and details I've got a longer a lens that goes to to 105 um, 50 millimeters 35 mil. I've got a range of lenses and I use them all really. Um, I guess I use the I use the one that, that goes to 105 quite a lot just because I can change that aperture and, I, and it fits a filter on the front as well. So I don't have to worry about if I'm in a, a gallery quickly changing a lens. So okay, there's, there's no real answer to that. I've got a whole range of lenses that I and I yeah. use them all. Uh, there is a question about fil filters. Uh, do they play a part in the photographs that you take? For the interior ones, I, I don't ever use filters, just purely because I don't have a chance to screw them on and, and put them in. I'm trying to get the photos as quickly as I can before I'm, I'm thrown out most of the time. But for any landscapes or anything that's exterior, um, almost always I'm using a filter, a gradient okay. filter coming down to, to balance the sky with the, the landscape. Um, question about pol uh, polarizers. Is that a preferred thing, external use, or do you not bother? Actually, I quite often use a polarizer, but ironically, to do the reverse to what it's meant to do, um, I, I often turn it the opposite way because it, it allows me to balance out really bright areas of sky and lighten um, other areas to balance those those really bright areas where the sun is. So rather than having that polarizer sort of making the, the blues enhanced and the clouds pop, I, I do the opposite and I can always um, change those in, in post projection if I need to. Okay, good. Um, there's a couple of things about tripods kind of co coming through. What kind of ball head do you use? Um, I, I think I've got, using. Yeah, I've got a couple with, with ball heads and um, the one that I've got at the moment is a, a Benro. Um, which is is really useful, but it, it's it's a mechanical head for the out the outdoor shots. I need that fine tuning and and balance. And and although the ball heads are quite quick to move, um, it, it doesn't let me me tune it to the, the degree that I need to really. So I, I swap between the two, but I, I use both. Okay. Do you use a um, 
uh, bubble they've just said do you use a bubble or do you do it by eye i think what they mean is, do you use a spirit level i think on the tripod there is one but I, i've never looked at the bubble in my life um for any shot um the back of the camera i, I have a, a leveler on the camera and I, I just use use that on the screen okay well uh last qu question coming through here very well done you guys already coming here. uh last question before we move on how uh, how do you get clearance for a tripod in locations occasionally i've emailed in advance i remember i i emailed birmingham library for a really nice shot that's on my website and, and they were fine about it um usually you you have to email and get permission um sort of prove that you're you're not a professional as well um otherwise i just take a, a small tripod in um, if there's room and it's empty i might set it up but I, I i virtually never do that inside just purely because it's actually quite dangerous and if there's legs coming out and people are walking around then I, i'm causing an obstruction but outside i use them all the time okay do you carry a beanbag or a tabletop tripod um I, I don't actually uh i have got one but I, I don't even put it in my bag i normally find a a fence or a wall or something that i can hold my camera onto and, and balance it on if i don't use a tripod a, a bit like this photo i use the top of a glass cabinet yeah uh okay last one i promise we'll go to the next image then uh do you use a cable release or do you use a timer trip I've got a cable release. I, I use that just so there's minimum movement in the camera. Um, yeah. or, more often than not, actually, I forget to put it in and halfway through the the photo. I'm like, oh gosh, I you know I can put this in, but I'm I'm too scared to then put it in in case I move the camera or the the, the focus slightly. But yes, I I, I do have one. And if I remember, I, I always put it in. Very good. Okay, next next image then, shall we? Go for a it. A color image. Ah. So um, this one, I remember, it's a London image. It's outside the Lloyds of London, which is the, the famous Richard Rogers building. You can see the sort of the architecture of the, the piping and ducting on the outside of the building behind this character I've taken the photo of. And it was a bit of a strange day, really, because I remember that there were astronauts and circus performers walking all around the city. And then I caught this this real character here that this worker and i thought you know this this typifies the the building and ever-changing landscape of, of london i wanted to to capture him reading this paper which ironically says london makes it possible like i remember standing on this kind of bollard and one of my friends was pushing on my back and holding me and i was desperately trying to keep my elbows in and focus on him and i, I finally pulled it a couple of shots off that, that kind of worked when I cropped them down. How how many days a year do you spend, you know, being photographer, as it were? You carry a camera all the time, in other words, or? I, I really don't know. That's a good question. Um, if I go on trips, I take it with me. If I'm going away somewhere, I'm going away to Cornwall next week, so I'll, I'll take it with me then. Sorry, this week I'm going away, so. If I, if I get the chance and it's in my bag, I'll take it. I don't always use it, though, because the problem is if you're a photographer and you're with other people, it, it's actually quite antisocial and people just don't get the fact that what you're doing is your passion and sometimes you need time to do it. And people expect that you can put the camera up, take your photo and, and that's it. But often I'll, I'll be in a location for hours, even for a, a landscape photo. So, yeah, I just to avoid that sort of anti-social nature, I, I sort of either go out and take photography or I, I don't take my camera at all. Otherwise, it's too tempting. Uh, are you tempted to just shoot on an iPhone? I think there's other phones available, by the way, okay? So... Uh... <laughs> I've, I've worked for iPhone. I, um, I, I don't take that many photos on it. I, I've hardly got any, to be honest. Um, I really do believe in sort of one of the, I'm one of these people that live for the moment. If you're at a beach or unless I'm I'm there to take photos, I don't get my photo out. I don't use it. Um, I, I think there's too much of a clip culture at the moment where people are continuously pressing the, the shoot button. They're not experiencing their surroundings at all. And then they come away and you've got 700 photos and they never look at them. So 
I, I don't see the point. Um, but if that's your thing, then great. It, it, this is an interest, interesting one, and you don't have to answer it if you don't want, all right? But during COVID lockdown one, Mark Mayer mentioned, did you play the photographer card and walk the streets? I didn't. Um, that's because I was teaching and I was teaching from home. So I, I didn't have that opportunity at all. Um, no, I was I was here sitting in the same place delivering online lessons. Otherwise, I, I would definitely have been doing that or trying to. Yeah. But That's an interesting. And, and within safe levels, I would have ne never done anything that was. No, 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 of course not. But it, it is, wasn't it? It's empty streets. Must have been an architectural photographer's absolutely dream, even if you went out in a spacesuit. Uh, must have been an absolute dream for them to do it and things, really. But uh, I, I, I drove back and forth to work each day um, to the studio and things, really, because we were live every day and things, really. And um, I, I even drove slower because I felt that if I caused an accident or caused myself to have an accident, I was going to put pressure on uh, the NHS that didn't need me to, and I had to drive to work, you know, that that's where the studios were and things really. But, uh, yeah, I did look around and basically think, God, there's an opportunity here for people to take photographs. Anyway, move on. Next image. Wow. So this is actually one of my favorite images, not necessarily for the image itself, but just the experience and the, the narrative behind it. This is Clifton Cathedral in Bristol. And incidentally, it's, it's one of these late brutalist, neo-brutalist structures that's, you know, it's fantastic. It's full of concrete. I love concrete. Uh, there, there's some really clear lines. It's industrial looking. It's really sparse and, and simplistic. But I just, I, I love these kind of buildings. It was at, it's actually the, in the 70s, I believe, the only um cathedral or church to be a grade two listed building from the 70s but anyway that's um that's not part of the story but i i went there and it was completely empty not a soul there um it was the weekend as well the doors were open i walked in and apart from the the chap that's at the back my friend adrian who looks like he's praying and that's not set up at all maybe he is maybe he's just embarrassed what i was doing uh, I can't even remember what was going through my mind here, but I wanted some kind of of person in the photo and there was no one there. So I put myself in and I ended up with this and we took some brilliant photos, all, all of the, the ceiling, the, the walls and some wide angle shots and some details. We set our tripods up because there was no one there for hours. And of course, when I left that plinth, there was a sign that was on the ground. I thought, oh, I'll pick it up. Someone's knocked it over. And of course, I picked the sign up and put it back. And it says, do not approach or go on to the plinth. So unfortunately, um, I, I didn't know that before I, I went and took this photo. But it's too late now. That photo is there. And it, again, it's one of those ones that, you know, what you make of it is what you make of it. it there's some kind of narrative there. And I, I'm sure people can can think of their own. Good. Um do you act, oh, sorry, back to the questions. Um, planning a trip, are you specifically looking at uh, ar architecture that you'd like to visit to photograph? Or how does your mind tick? <laughs> That's a weird one. Thank you. That's my mind tick. People don't want to know that. I, I can't answer that one. Um, yeah. Let's no. leave that one. Let's just go back to the first part of the question. No, no I, I plan purposefully to. I, I, I seek certain buildings, I, I research them, I look at the photos that are online already, I, I think, can I add something different, can I improve them? Um, and, and obviously they're, they're either architects that I, I follow and admire and, and love their style, particularly buildings with commanding sort of roofs and inflections and curves, um, or, or anything made of concrete I love as well. You can't beat a bit of concrete. What do you do with the photographs that you take? Um, I just save them on a, a hard drive. Uh, ones that I'm really pleased with, I enter into to competitions. I normally enter into the Fermani Group competitions that are sort of geared towards architecture. Very good. 
Um, do you photograph anything else besides for buildings? Um, I've, one of the last photos I think is a, a landscape photo and I, I've moved a bit into trying to dabble with landscape. I, I'm not quite there yet and I've got a lot to learn but I'm enjoying the the process of the photography. It's similar in some ways to architecture, you know, that, that there's a lot of time that, that you have on your hands. If you want to take a photo, you can set yourself up, it's a slow process. And I use landscape photography similar to architecture in, in a way of relaxation, just going into my own space, take a coffee with me, and uh, it, it's a good day out for me, even if I don't end up with any really good photos. Okay. Um, uh, speaking about going out, uh, what's your preference, dawn or dusk? Uh, I, I would go out at dawn, but I'm a terrible person for getting up early in the morning. I, I have done before, but only if I, I go somewhere abroad on a trip, I'll make that effort. I always say, oh, I'll get up really early. I set my alarm and I, I roll over and I go out in the evening instead. Um, I've not been on a street walk before with a group of photographers, but this weekend I am. Any advice? Well, go. <laughs> definitely, definitely go. Have go. time. Take as many photos as you can, um, and, and just enjoy yourself. Grab a coffee. Um, ask plenty of questions. Look at what people are taking photos of, um, of that are around. Uh, don't be afraid to to sort of join someone and take a similar photo to to the one they're taking. Ask them to show you what they've got on your camera, and if if you're not sure about anything, whoever's leading that walk ask technical questions so that you come away at the end having the experience that's that's not just taking the photos but a learning educational one as well enjoy it just enjoy the day. i was going to say on a personal level i think a photo walk is like-minded people isn't it it doesn't mean just because somebody's a leader of the walk that a really good photographer um they just love the passion about photography so that's absolutely key um scott That's kelby good. years ago didn't he? he kind of began a big kind of um walk the world as it were i can't remember what his street uh, um kind of but he was encouraging on a cer certain day of the year to kind of meet up and there was kind of ways and, and things really i joined in quite a few of those uh and and it, you know it's really great to actually just be a photographer and take things perhaps at times you wouldn't you usually take and and as you said um it's interesting when you're with a group of photographers and you see somebody who's obviously got an eye for one thing and they're actively looking at things, whether it's people's or products or places or whatever it would be, but you can just almost people watch or photographer watch. Uh, I don't think there's a troll name for that yet, but um, it, it is an interesting. So I'm really pleased that you're going out for a photo walk. I, I think we need to get back to those more and more. In fact, really, I think that's a really good idea to, Stim, uh, stimulate them. Uh, do you go on photo walks yourself with friends? Um, I used to be a member of a camera club and I used to take people to London and, and run them myself. So I, I love them and, and it, it gets people taking photos of things they don't normally take photos of, especially street photography. In cities, there's so many characters. Everyone's always going to come away with something really unique and, and different. And it's a good social experience. You meet new people, you make contacts, you network. Great idea. Um, I'm thoroughly envious. Yeah, and 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 just on that, I don't know what your age is and things really, but I think at times as well, it's a safe a safety net. I think together you can feel really safer, you know. Especially, you know, um, I kind of remember from my youth, you know, let's go into a car park uh, and shoot in the cut, you know, the stair the stairwell or on top of the buildings, you know, silly things like that. Uh, you know, forty years ago plus. You wouldn't think twice about it but perhaps today especially if you're not as confident um kind of going into some weird locations that's a really good idea to actually go with a photo walk and things really but just be aware of the surroundings be aware who's around you as well especially if you're in a busy location because you can get a little bit blinded by a camera and you kind of forget yeah. what's going on as well and things really. oh we could do a whole thing on photo we could walk, like, couldn't we? yeah yeah kind of thing with it you know but um yeah, but I, anyway. I would say as well, um, also, if, if people approach you and, and they ask you not to take photos, even if you feel you have the right to, don't just don't take the photos. Don't uh, risk upsetting anyone. 
even if you're in the right, it, it will make your, your day negative. You'll have a negative experience. So, you know, just, just cut your losses and, and move on if that happens. And it, it could well happen if you're in a city. Yeah, and, and take minimal kit. Unless you know specifically what you want to do, um, just avoid it. Otherwise, security is going to be around in UK and moving you on. And you've touched on that already. Let's not go there. Right, let's do another, another image. Oh, so this is another London image. This is one new change, which is just outside St Paul's Cathedral. Um, I think it's a, it's a Jean Nouvel um, piece of architecture, and it, it's a shopping centre. Uh, it's one of these new pseudo public spaces. There, there's shops on one level and there, there's office on the other. It's a new development, relatively new anyway. And the thing I like about this staircase is I, I don't normally have photos that are floating, so to speak, in, in a sea of, of one colour, or, or in this case, it, it's completely black with, and you can't see any details. But I like the idea of really isolating it. And you don't really know where these people are coming from. You don't know where they're going to. They kind of look like they're on a mission going somewhere. It looks quite important. And I think, to be honest, whoever was walking up that staircase, whatever they were wearing or carrying, they, they would have looked important. For me, it was almost a kind of sci-fi um, feel, as if they're walking up maybe to a, a spaceship and they're about to go on a journey. But it, it, it's the walking into the, the unknown that I quite like. It's a very mysterious image and the, the, the black and white it kind of adds to that. Okay, a uh, question coming through. It, it was before um, about people in landscape. Um, they ask quite a lot of questions at the same time, so I'm kind of spreading them out. Um, how are people in the architecture perceived in competition? Is it good or is it bad? Um, I would say that, I mean, I've had about 100 shots that have, have been placed or won competitions and probably about 75% have some kind of human form in them, but not taking over from the architecture. It, it, it's, it's the architecture that has to sing and, and the people that are in the photos, they have to add to it in some way or it has to be part of the narrative. Otherwise, it just doesn't work. But, but I always feel that quite often, unless it's a really minimalist photo, that it, it adds it some kind of intrigue and and storyline to them and they kind of work well for me do you think it's to do with scale um so the people in the landscape for the competition now for a minute do you think this the person in the landscape or in this case people um add to the scalability so people can feel size do you think that's something to do with it uh, just from your point of view i mean i mean that that's that that's quite feasible and, and they, they do give a sense of scale. I think generally, you know, with a staircase or a building the size of it anyway, unless it's a, an abstract shot. I think it's more about if people are judging photos, they're going to see a lot of very similar photos and, and they want to, to feel something or they want to imagine some kind of narrative and people allow them to empathise or to enter that photo. So I feel from the point of view of providing a storyline, I think that really helps. Yeah, the, sto the storytelling is key, isn't it? I suppose architects, they want people to walk into their buildings and use them in the same way as a, a sofa designer wants you to look at it and go, oh my God, that looks great. I want to sit on it. That How does it sit? How does it fit? And I suppose we look at it through photographic eyes and we go graphic, go, oh my God, that looks amazing. But the functionality, I suppose, for the architect is a totally different kind of mindset. It's got to be beautiful, but practical. And it's got to want to make people to go to work as well, I suppose, or use that facility. Definitely, architecture has to have a function as well as a form and it, it just marries the two together, really. Yeah, good, thank you, love that. And our last image. Landscape, so, you touched on that. Yeah, well, landscapes. I mean, there is architecture around the corner. There's a lighthouse just to the right. 
um, but not in the actual image. Um, this is one of my favourite areas actually. It's in Cornwall. It, it's out from St Ives Bay. It's got Reavy Rocks. And it's got Reavy Lighthouse just to the right. But um, it's one of those wild, inhospitable places when the, the tide is coming in, the waves are crashing. There's, there really is probably something magical about the light in St Ives. Um, obviously, Barbara Hepworth, um, Ben Nicholson down there, so very famous artists and photographers in their own right. Um, and actually, this the reason I chose this is because there's a story to this shot as well. I almost didn't take this photo. I I'm a terrible cricketer, and it, it seems bizarre that I'm bringing cricket into this. But about six weeks before, I broke my finger playing cricket at school. I mean, I always break something or get an injury. I won't go into that. I, I'm a terrible <laughs> cricketer. So I'm always very careful on rocks. I scout them out. I make sure they're not slippery. I've got trainers with a, a Michelin sole that stops me slipping. So anyway, there was a freak wave that came along as I was walking across these rocks. And I had a tripod in one hand, I had my camera around my shoulder in the other, I had a backpack on, and it just completely took my feet away. I, I've, I've never been in a position like that before. It, it sounds ridiculous to how you, you should be able to see a wave, but I didn't see it coming. And of course, having my tripod in this hand, I placed my hand down to break my fall on the rock, but my finger was broken and it was all, it had been um, put in a, not in a cast, but in this splint. And as it hit the rock, it was so painful that I took it out the way and I basically face planted myself onto the rock. Uh, my nose was bleeding. I fell into the water. It was up to my shoulders. It was freezing cold. There was blood coming down my face. And I turn around and there's a guy on the rock on a, um, in a, in a deck chair reading a book and he makes eye contact with me looks at me and just nonchalantly shakes his head at me as if to say what are you doing he didn't help me at all you know i fished myself out i had to go back in to collect my tripod that the waves were taking in and out and all this time he was just shaking his head and i i was soaking wet and freezing cold um and it was overcast at the time but i stayed out and eventually i i got this photo um, so I was pleased just because I persevered with this one. But it was a painful experience. Uh, so, yeah, humanity is not lost in that part of the world. Then, is it? <laughs> at least he didn't laugh at you. And that would be something that I, I might have come over and helped, you know, but I've been laughing on the way. So I'm not sure which would be good with that or not. Can I do with it? So I've got some uh, cracking selfies of my nose, but I obviously didn't include those. <laughs> oh, brilliant. Can I do with it? Tom, absolutely uh, cracking. Thank, thank you so much. Uh, we've got a couple of questions to actually finish off with. Uh, last chance to actually get any more quest, uh, questions in, guys, if that's good. Um, let's start in uh, Ger uh, Germany, the Berlin image. Just happens to be the last image and things really. Could you talk about the exposure here? Is it um, focus point or is it average or how have you exposed? Um, it was so long ago. I probably, I think what I did is I must have set up before the the person came down the stairs purposefully to capture them. So I probably locked the focus on that rule of thirds where they are. And I waited for them to get to that point once the focus was locked in and just shot away as, as many as I could. OK, uh, could you briefly explain your layering te technique, uh, specifically the first image? So it was the one in the Baku, yeah? Um, there was one for the sky. There would have been one for the the building, one for the foreground, and maybe three or four to to take out imperfections or or people that I didn't want in the photo. So maybe about six or seven images in total. Okay. Um, the colouring seems very subdued in the colour images, except for the man with the paper. Uh, the paper is that style management by you? Definitely, I like to strip back the colour as well. Um, the the colour photos, there are a variety that, that I mean, I don't have a particular colour style, I don't think, but I do I do like to strip as much back as possible. Okay, um, are you shooting raw? Always. Good, good answer. Um, is the post processing done in raw, uh, or is it in Photoshop? 
so the workflow starts in Lightroom. I'll, I'll adjust what I can in Lightroom and then I'll only transport it into Photoshop if I need to layer or remove something that I can't remove in Lightroom. Okay. Um, any suggestions on a specific tri uh, tripod? Don't own one yet. Um, I mean, there's such a range of tripods, sizes, weights. It depends what size of camera you have as well, what you intend to use it for. Do you want a one? I would go to the, the, the Photoshop that you're buying it from. Tell them the kind of photography that you do, where you're going to be going, and, and they can probably show you a range of tripods. I, I've probably got about six of them. Yeah, I, I, obviously on a personal level, um, make it as light as you can, but as hev heavy as you need, you need it to keep it still. Um, if you're working in waves and if you're working in um, windy conditions, you've got to. It doesn't matter if it's on a tripod or not. You've got to keep it still and things really. So, try and have something that you can hang your camera, your camera bag from the middle column to kind of centralize the weight down as well with it. But something like the carbon five fiber, if you can afford it, it's a, bi a bit like buying a lens. I think I'm not sure if you agree with that, Tom, or not. But you know, a tripod is really for life. You're not going to buy a cheap one and then change it, you know, in 12 months, not unless you bought a shite one. Sorry, not a very good one. Yeah, I've got a, the one I mainly use is a, a Benro geared head. It, it's a carbon fiber one. It, it cost me a fortune, but I've had it for ages. As I've mentioned, I've thrown it in the water. It's fallen down rocks. It, it, it's been through everything and it looks like it's brand new. It doesn't rust anywhere as it's carbon fiber. It, it's heavy and, and the actually the it's heavy because of the head if i was to take the geared head off it would be quite light but i, I don't mind carrying around the excessive weight because it is just such a good tripod good um oh uh laura in fact <laughs> our law our laura uh do you have a, do you have a wish list of places to visit to photograph and if so, where's next? Yeah, I, I mean, I've got a list as long as my arm. I, I, I actually planned recently to go to Norway. I'd like to visit the, the Twist Museum. And also I, I want to think about new projects where I'm looking at cabins now in and the, the way that these cabins are placed in, in forests or by lakes and, and that kind of juxtaposition of, of small modern architecture in natural surroundings even some of the mountain museums in the Mesner range places like that are really sort of taking my fancy at the moment but we'll need careful planning okay somebody's got a uh, habit for bridges <laughs> and most of their life is wasted finding the perfect bridge any advice to get off them <laughs> just to <laughs> jump <laughs> <laughs> it's interesting that they should say that because I, to begin with, when I first started architecture, I was obsessed with bridges as well. And no matter um, how many photos I took from whatever angle, whatever light conditions, I'm one of these people that cannot get bridges to work at all. Um, so maybe just move on, cut your losses. And if it's not working, um, visit somewhere else, look at some other architecture. Look, I love doors. And 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 I just love doors. I, I, you know, don't worry about it. It's not like drugs or anything, you know. It's just you you find yourself being attracted to something that somebody's made with love and care and style and so on with it. If you love bridges, don't worry about them. Uh, kind of thing with it. Uh, Tom, thank you so so much for the tonight. Absolutely brilliant to see your F8 uh, eight images. Um, if you want to see a little bit more of Tom Knowles' um, photographs, head over to TomKnowlesPhotography.com and uh, you can actually see more of his work as well as uh, some of the uh, images with the awards and everything else with it. Any tips on en entering awards um, before we finish, Tom? Um, some of these competitions are quite expensive, so I would dip your toes in the water, think about images that um work for you that you've seen work in, in competitions that are similar enter those and if they do well keep entering in that kind of style if it's your style and suits you brilliant 
Thank you very much, Tom. Absolutely Thank brilliant you. night. Thank you so, so much. And I look forward to when I can buy uh, buy you a beer. I'm sure there'll be some place at some stage where we go, oh, you owe, uh, you owe me a beer, yeah? Uh, and we'll just go from there. As a teacher, you don't drink, of course. So, uh, yeah, just go from there. In, in moderation, of course. Oh, oh, that's what it's called nowadays. Okay, lovely. With a, Thanks, with boys. A <laughs> Take care. Thank you. Thanks, boys and Have girls. See you all soon. Out.